So much of growing vegetables is about finding ways to manage what is inherently both complicated and complex. And to reduce a lot of what needs to be kept track of or figured out into simple approaches or advice rules and conventions to follow. This is the stuff that fills so many books about how to plan, organize, and lay out a garden so that it can be more productive, easier to manage, and with a greater chance of success. For example, most of the gardens that I manage follow a similar crop rotation, with a planting plan for each rotation that I reuse and adapt each season, mainly because it helps me to make decisions, or more accurately, to reduce the number of decisions that I need to make each year. And this helps a lot, especially with so many gardens to manage. But this structure or guidance doesn't really work with the more complex, integrated methods of the polyculture garden. And I think that this is one of the key reasons that I've struggled with this method. I've been trying to address this issue for a while, and this year I changed the method that I used to manage this polyculture garden to a more clustered approach. And so far it has been quite successful, and in ways it is quite similar to an approach that I rejected in the past. Polyculture is fundamentally focused on integrating rather than segregating crops, and it shares a lot with companion planting, permaculture, and intercropping, including the well-known example of the three sisters of corn, squash, and beans. My initial inspiration for trying this polyculture method came from a short second or third hand description of a method used by people in a very different context and climate. It included basic instructions for broadcast sowing seeds from a wide mix of different crops into the same bed, harvesting many plants when small to make space for the remaining ones to develop, and transplanting in larger or longer growing plants into the spaces created through continual harvesting and thinning. This was enough inspiration for me to try this radically different growing method as one of the family scale gardens that I manage, but I have not been successful with it, mainly because it needs a lot more attention than I've been able to give it, which usually resulted in there being way too much competition for many of the plants, with not enough space for anything to grow well. This method of gardening also didn't really fit into the overall Red Gardens project, as it was difficult to calculate and compare yields with all the plants mixed up, and the approach really didn't fit well within the way that I think or like to organize and plan things. All of this combined with a serious lack of advice on what to do, especially for this climate and at this scale, so this year I decided to make radical changes and to try out a different approach in how to plan, manage, and lay out this garden. I have ended up taking an approach that is quite similar to the square foot gardening method, which is interesting as when I had an opportunity to add another garden to the set of family scale gardens about five years ago, I was considering trying this method but decided against it. The square foot gardening method seems to be quite useful in the context of a small back garden and not so appropriate for the larger space that I'm working at. And it also involved building raised beds that would be filled with a special mix of imported growing medium. And I wanted to work with the really good topsoil that I already had. But the main focus of this method was in the name and involved dividing beds up into one square foot sections or a 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter grid and planting each grid with a different crop. And there was detailed advice about how many plants of each crop to grow in each square foot section. In hindsight, this is quite close to polyculture, or at least advanced intercropping, and is quite different from all the plants laid out in long lines or filling full beds, which is the base structure of all the other gardens. So while I haven't built any raised beds or imported special growing medium to fill them, this year I've divided the entire garden into a grid of equal sized sections, with each grid occupied by a different vegetable and the number of plants in each grid depending on the type of plant. But I'm not using the square foot size for each section, which I think is a fairly arbitrary measurement. And instead I'm going with a grid size that makes more sense in my context. Each of the family scale gardens that I'm working with are 10 meters by 10 meters. And I've divided the polyculture garden into six beds, about 1.2 meters wide and 10 meters long, with paths of about 50 centimeters wide between them. If I was using the square foot grid, the bed would be divided in four across the width and 32 along the length. But I felt that this was too small of a unit to work with, primarily for a lot of the brassica family plants. I grow a lot of cabbages, cauliflower, broccoli, kale, and Brussels sprout plants, all of which are quite large, and the general recommendation for planting distances would require almost twice as much space for each plant, or even more. Put another way, the square foot grid density would squeeze 128 brassica plants into a bed, 
and the general advice about how far apart to space plants like these would restrict it to between 30 and 75 plants within each bed. But that spacing advice is based on similar plants growing beside each other, and in the polyculture garden that isn't always the case. One of the core potential benefits of intercropping and polyculture is that plant densities can be increased. That, for example, I can plant a carrot and an onion closer together than I can plant two onions together because the carrot and the onion both take up different spaces above and below ground and their roots occupy different zones within the soil and have different nutritional requirements. There is also the possibility of taking advantage of different plants growing at different rates and maturing at different times, which allows more of a relay succession of crops rather than everything maturing at the same time or waiting for one crop to finish before the other one can be planted. So I decided to work towards the upper end of the recommendations for density to squeeze in more plants or sections into the beds. So I divided each bed into three across the width and 20 along the length, giving 60 grid sections in each bed. Each grid section measuring 40 centimeters by 50 centimeters, given an area of 0.2 square meters or just over two square feet, more than twice the area and less than half the number of sections of the square foot garden. For the larger brassica plants, this grid system seems fairly straightforward, but most of the other plants that I grow take up less space, and I see this approach as a polyculture of clusters, with several plants of the same crop scattered between clusters of other groupings of different crops. I worked through differing advice about plant densities from the other gardens and came up with a number of plants for each cluster of all of the different vegetable plants that I wanted to include. A cluster could include one large brassica plant or a potato plant, two or three plants like chard, lettuce, or broad beans, five garlic or leek plants, eight parsnip or beetroot plants, 10 spinach plants, 12 pea plants, or up to 20 carrots. But the squash and courgette plants needed a lot more space than one cluster, and for these plants I set aside a group of grid spaces for the plants to grow into. Although this is moving away from a true polyculture approach, where I would aim to not have similar plants growing beside each other, I felt that this compromise was better for this context and for me. This grid-based clustering method also makes it easier to plan and provide some baseline numbers of density that I could aim for and adapt over the seasons, and to get information about yields that I could compare more effectively with the other gardens. And more importantly, I felt that this could allow me to work more effectively to reduce the amount of competition that had been the biggest issue that I've had with the more integrated approaches that I've tried in the past, though I still have a lot of work to do on that. Once I established the possible densities of plants, depending on the type of plant in each cluster, I still had the issue of how to organize all of this into six beds, with a total of 360 clusters to fill in the full garden. One approach that I was tempted to try would be to randomly plant different vegetables in clusters across a full garden and to see what happened. This would possibly be the best method to figure out what works and what doesn't, to offer the greatest opportunities of learning from successes and failures, but it would also be the hardest to keep track of and it would make it difficult to find the vegetables that needed to be harvested. I also wanted to work with the basic principles of companion planting, that some plant pairings can be a lot more beneficial than others, and some pairs should be avoided. And some plants can be easily overwhelmed by more assertive plants beside them, and others seem to naturally fit in beside others. There is also the issue of different growing seasons or staggered planting times and the possibility of successional cropping of a lot of types of plants, and the need to make sure that there is space for the types of vegetables that need to be planted later in the season. Some crops also need to be covered in order to keep out pests, with most of the brassicas needing to be covered with netting to keep away the cabbage butterfly and their leaf-munching caterpillars. And a finer mesh is usually needed to keep away the carrot flies, so unless I wanted to cover all of the beds in the whole garden, I needed to segregate some crops into a few beds. In addition, I usually grow runner beans up tripods made from long wooden poles, and they need sets of three appropriately spaced clusters left open for these warm season crops. And once the tripods go in, there can't be any netting or other covers. And the same goes with pea plants, unless I was willing to let them grow scrambling over the ground. And I need to keep room for courgette and squash plants to be able to grow into, so only fast maturing spring crops can be sown in some of the adjacent clusters, or they need to be left empty.
So taking into consideration all these issues and more, there is a fair amount of planning and organization that can go into this garden, determining what types of plants go into which bed, and there are so many opportunities and options, and still a huge amount to explore in all of this. Competition in this garden is still an issue, which is not surprising given that I'm still trying to grow a lot of plants close together, and some are naturally more stronger and aggressive than their neighboring plants might be. With all of the plants and the beds continually occupied, it has been a struggle to maintain sufficient amounts of soil fertility and moisture, which will affect some crops a lot more than others. And I still need to harvest very regularly, especially with some of the crops that are planted at a higher density, where they were expected to be harvested quite young. And the longer I left them, the bigger they grew, and the more competition there was within the cluster and with neighboring crops. There is also an issue of managing succession within the bed, replanting a cluster with another crop when the previous crop is done, and the newly sown seedlings or transplants often have quite mature plants in adjacent clusters, and take longer to establish. Just because a cluster of plants grows well at the beginning of the season when everything else in the bed is still quite small, doesn't mean the same number of plants will thrive when sown later in the season in amongst more established plants. These issues of competition can be improved with better soil fertility management and watering, being careful what plants to place next to others, and adopting the density of plants in a cluster depending on how full the rest of the bed is. And I do find the weeding of this garden a lot easier, especially with the direct sown crops, as there is only one type of plant to look out for, and the thinning is much more straightforward compared to the broadcast sown method that I used to use. I also find it easier to diversify the plantings of this garden, to add in herbs and pollinator attracting plants, or to grow different crops and different varieties of the crops that I do grow. Although this is all possible in any of the other gardens, it seems easier to fit things in when the garden is divided into 360 sections or clusters, rather than the long rows or fixed beds of the other gardens which tend to be filled with one plant. When the object of the growing method is to diversify and to integrate different plants rather than segregate, this grid method seems to open up a lot more opportunities while still offering a degree of control and planning that can be useful when working to get the most out of a garden and to possibly establish some repeatable patterns and plans that can be adapted each year. And I quite enjoy the challenge of it all, and the possibilities of a very different way of organizing a garden, and the opportunities to learn from a much greater diversity of interactions between all the plants. And this is a very welcome change from the frustrations that I felt from not being successful with the polyculture method that I used to use. <laughs>